Okay, so we're, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Abby. Abby, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. So as Lauren was saying, this is a very timely topic these days, and uh, there seems to be a lot of discussion about the fact that it's difficult to get uh, commercial buildings upgraded, uh, specifically for energy efficiency, because of lack of finance and lack of funds. This has been an ongoing um, issue, and so over the last several years, a number of different initiatives have begun to pop up and to develop to help uh, close this gap, to help make it possible to do deeper retrofits um, beyond kind of the, you know, changing out the CFLs or some lightweight uh, lighting retrofits to more uh, significant um, upgrades that will really impact uh, carbon uh, emissions and also reduce your energy load and save money. So most of you all are probably familiar with the size of the market and some of the issues, but just to kind of put it in context, $127 billion per year uh, in energy efficiency upgrade value is going to be occurring from now for the next 10 years. This is worldwide, but basically it's saying that this amount of money uh, per year can be made in doing energy efficiency retrofits. So it's a big market. And as, as a result, we're seeing more and more players come into this market, uh, also at, uh, at the local level as well as the institutional level. Uh, you've probably seen this number a lot. Uh, you know, it ranges from 30 to 40, whether you're thinking about uh, electricity or residential and commercial. Basically, the point is commercial buildings and residential buildings use an enormous amount of our energy. It's the single biggest uh, source uh, for our energy usage, and so it's something that is important to try to reduce. Uh, you can really see a difference in the value of an asset if you employ energy efficiency measures. And there's more ways to do it than just on this, on this slide, but the point is that here's a very direct way you can improve your bottom line. That is reducing your utility costs, and that is from having your utility bill be lower year after year, a combination of reducing the actual amount of energy, electricity and gas, and water you're consuming. And as a result, you're less impacted by rising utility costs. So from two sides, you can really uh, save money in your operating expenses. You can see them, you know, uh, be significantly lower, and as a result, your net operating income for your building, if you're an investor-owned uh, commercial real estate developer, goes up. And the primary way that uh, buildings are valued these days is by taking a market capitalization rate over the net operating income, and that's your value. So the higher your NOI, the higher your value. So it's, it's something that uh, seems simple, and when I've talked to some of my colleagues in the uh, mortgage banking and lender world, they go, yeah, of course, it makes complete sense. Uh, but somehow, so it's been difficult to translate this concept to actually having lenders underwrite uh, this, uh, this concept. You know, for property owners, they want to basically see how energy efficiency can increase the bottom line, and finding out creative ways to do that with putting out the least amount of cash up front and paying the least amount in terms of the financing cost as possible. For contractors, energy efficiency financing means another vehicle to get their projects done. So I have one um, light friend and president of a lighting company uh, out of Texas is very excited about some of the new innovative financing vehicles because for them, for some of their big customers, they're actually helping, they're doing financing for their big REITs that they help install LED retrofits for their shopping center uh, parking light, for example, but you know they don't want to do that. They're in the business of manufacturing and developing and and selling uh, different lighting products. They do not want to be financing, so they're looking and wanting and needing other ways to do that. And also, there's the government entities, which uh, Michelle is a part of. Um, how can they utilize what's coming out to help improve their energy efficiency programs and help figure out a way to get them done through innovative financing problem. So that traditionally, if you want to go do upgrades um, to your building, uh, you know, from anything from a roof to tenant improvements to your boiler, usually you had a construction loan, 65 to 75 percent, then you put in your own equity, maybe you get some incentives in there from your local utility and from any kind of federal incentives if you're doing um, renewables, or, and, and then that's it. That's kind of the way it's been working. Uh, and we're seeing that, you know, in an attempt to reduce the owner equity uh, and or replace the owner equity, and also due to waning and, you know, rescinding incentives, there's been other 
vehicles that are really starting to make a play in the private sector. And as Lauren pointed out, you know, there's there's lots of nuances to uh, the different kinds of financing, but the ones that we're talking about today, uh, focusing on PACE in particular, but also touching on uh, many different kinds of off-balance sheet types of financing, such as energy service agreements, uh, operating leases, power purchase agreements, etc. And the fact that, of course, there are a multitude of public and private incentives. So, so so this is again a rather simple diagram, but it shows you know you figure out what you're paying today, uh, you figure out what you need to do to uh, a project you want to undertake, uh, and you figure out, for example, you say I want to do this five hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, retrofit in my building, which includes maybe a boiler and some lighting, etc. Uh, so I say, great, this is what I want to do. A third party ESCO energy service company or vendor of another type engineering company will come in and say, okay. We will purchase through our own financing mechanisms the product, and then we will um, you will pay for this product over time through the savings. And we will either take all of the savings or the majority of the savings for, until the until the actual um, product is paid off for. So um, it can be a shared savings agreement or 100% uh, paid through the savings, and then at the end of six or seven years, you get your savings and you get your product. So in this case, $500,000, say you save $100,000 a year. Um, you have, as a building owner, you're going to incur 20% of the savings and your third party provider who put in the equipment is going to take 80%. So 80%, that's $80,000, um, you'll basically, they will have paid off, including your little profit, which is including that 80000 they will um, have paid off the cost of installing the product and the product itself, which is boiler and lighting. And at the end of six and a quarter years, um, the financing agreement is over, and you, the building owner, will get all the savings uh, after that point, as well as the equipment that is then yours to yeah, Because I think, well, yeah. actually, Michelle said that she's curious about uh, resiliency, resiliency assurance. Uh, can you address that? Okay. Resiliency means that for hurricane-related or storm-related items, they are putting a charge um, they're requiring that property insurance, uh, when you get your property insurance, that there's a charge added to that so that it helps cover for, it creates like a fund to help pay for a lot of the issues that come up with uh, storms and whatnot. So it's not specific to energy efficiency, but it's something we're seeing in PACE as well, which is property assessed clean energy. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of clean energy bond financing where you're they're all in addition to clean energy and energy efficiency measures, they're also adding things like storm shutters and, and certain kinds of generators to that list of things you can do because they see this as a really big issue. Um, yeah, clearly that's something that would be uh, related to climate change, resilience and adaptation. Uh, there was a great article in the Washington Post just recently about North Carolina. About how the scientists down there had said that uh, sea level rise due to climate change was essentially going to wipe out 70 million dollars worth of real estate on the coast you know over the over the coming years and and obviously there was a lot of property interest down there that didn't necessarily want that information out there because it would just you know the the right. bottom of the real estate market would just fall out nobody's going to buy a house a vacation house that's going to be underwater in a few years so um, um, is there anything in the industry in the real estate industry that is looking at those types of things yeah from my my experience it's really coming more from the clean energy side so pace is addressing that and governments are starting to address this issue but uh, you know uh, i think some property assurers are starting to look at things like that they certainly do it for earthquakes and whatnot out west. So it's something that uh, I have not seen any particular vehicles come out of the woodwork for resiliency, but I think it's something that's going to happen. And the fact that in Florida, this is like uh, considered to be one of the major proponents. Well, I'll go into I'll talk about it with Pace, but it's a major driver for that program. And the same in San Francisco. In San Francisco, there are requirements that I think it's buildings over uh, 10 units or more multifamily. Uh, units you have to do retrofits, seismic retrofits. This is a huge cost. If you're a building a, a owner, building owner for ten units, it's not necessarily you know a huge proper, Simon property you know group. So you know it's 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 a big it's a big burden, 
and they're having to do it. They're required. And so uh, San Francisco has, is, is using their ability to allow that to be included as part of other energy efficiency measures. So Interesting. Interesting. Also, so combining that's also showing a lot more interest as a result because they have to do it. You know, unless you have a mandate for energy, which some people do, of course, you have to do it, and you have to do it now, or you're building, you can't get it insured, you can't get it financed. So it's, uh, it's more urgent. Okay. So tell us about PACE. I mean, how does PACE work into uh, these different um, um, compelling reasons to integrate energy efficiency, and how does it differ from some of the other uh, types of agreements, like on-bill financing and, and um, energy service agreements and those sorts of things? Yeah, well, they, they certainly are related. So one of the thing, the thing about PACE and why PACE was developed, it, it stands for, first of all, Property Assessed Clean Energy. And basically, it was developed um, as a way to, to try to get to deeper retrofits. It was really more of a public policy uh, creation from Berkeley in California. Uh, it was not meant to be, a, you know, it was meant, they didn't know if it was going to be a private sector initiative. And it, it has become that and not public sector primarily in terms of its interests. But the reason why it was created is because even energy service agreements, uh, first of all, there's very few, you can't do small projects. So most of the energy service companies, the Siemens, the Johnson Controls of the World, um, the Schneider Electrics, they want bigger deals because they're used to the mush market, they're used to the municipal, university, uh, I guess the governmental, and the hospital market. And so for them, anything under a million is really not that worth it to them because for them, they make their money off of the equipment and off of the agreements after the fact. So this is a diagram that's extremely simple. And, the, and I say that with the caveat that we're actually in the process of working with um, an investor and, and a municipality and developing your program. And the, the nuances that go into this di diagram are very extensive. And it's, it can be quite complicated based on when you're doing you know, the work and who's getting paid and when you're getting paid and how it's reported. But generally, you have um, a building owner who wants to do a project. Um, the building owner, it can also be a contractor. If you slip up with their, with their contractor um, boxes, the contractor may also go to the building owner and say, hey, um, I, think, you know, I, wanna, I think you can put in, here's the, here's the payback or here's the analysis for putting in LEDs into your building your office building. And the building owner goes, great, okay, how do we finance it? And the contractor goes, hey, you have PACE here in this jurisdiction. Um, and as a result, um, the building owner applies for the funding, um, and they usually apply through the funding through a program of some sort. Um, and they get, But they also can go and find their own investors who are out there waiting to find building owners like this one. And um, they fund the PACE investor provides financing to do the work and then they are repaid through the county or the city tax collector uh, over a period of time that's been determined uh, at the onset. So if it's a solar project, then it's paid over 20 years. And every year, either once or twice a year, the PACE investor will receive from the tax collector the, the tax, the lien, just as someone would receive a property tax. Majority of the programs on this map are not government funded or assisted. Um, and that is the trend for sure going forward because of this desire to have it be a private financing initiative. And let me just make sure there's another question related here. Um, Michelle is also asking, in the case the payment doesn't come until after construction, how are initial construction costs covered? So in the government funded or assisted program, was off in the warehouse or construction financing is provided from that program. In other cases, you have what's called um, uh, a one-stop shop model, a turnkey model. That's primarily Y Green. Uh, they're in uh, Atlanta, South Florida, Sacramento, uh, and I think that's it for now. Um, and they basically will provide everything from the contractor, the audit, fi the uh, financing, everything. Um, but they're fairly close in terms of uh, competition, and so a lot of cities and counties uh, are not buying into why green is the only one they want to use because they want to make sure they have the ability to offer their constituents the most competitive offering in terms of all the different service providers. 
So that in that case, why green? In the one-stop shop, that's construction financing is paid by the PACE program administrator. In the case of government funded programs or supported like uh, Connecticut and Sonoma County, they help provide the construction financing. The vast majority of them are either um, are provided at the end of the construction period and potentially there's one interim payment. So in the, in the one that we're developing now in Florida, basically for larger projects, uh, if there's a requirement that the contractor buy, say, a million dollars worth of you know, product, um, we will do interim financing for a part of that, a partial payment, similar to a draw in a construction financing project, and then the rest would be paid at the closing of the bond issuance. Are, are there any sort of underlying factors that uh, drive people to um, do one model as opposed to the other? Yeah, I would say it's money. Uh, so, you know, for a good example would be San Francisco. I've been talking to Rich Chen, who's who's uh, in charge of their program for, for a long time. And, you know, they're, the, they're one of the greenest cities in the country. And, you know, they have one case deal done, basically. So why why is that? And, and he was saying, really, it's because we don't have an ability to provide financing to building owners today and saying, we can give you the money now, and then we have our, you know, bunch of investors out there who are willing to, to buy the bond at the end. There's plenty of investors that buy the bond once the project's done. There aren't that many that are there up front to help get the project actually done. And so you do get back to that issue of upfront capital, which is why right now other methods such as energy service agreements are still attractive because those groups will provide the financing up front. Um, right. So the biggest issue is money. And if you don't have the money, ability to get the money uh, at some level or create some kind of incentive like a reserve fund where you can kind of buy down some of the program costs, uh, you, you, I think the best way forward, honestly, is a hybrid model where you can you can get a, a bank to provide you um, uh, kind of construction financing for a certain percentage percentage of the deals, the smaller deals that no one's really interested in, until they can be pooled together to sell as an issuance to a large base investor, and then so you have that little you have a small construction financing vehicle, and then you have uh, ability for any property owner to bring their own investor in. To finance their projects. So Simon Property Group, for example, in New Jersey is already looking at doing PACE. They're going to kind of go around the existing group because they can, because they have their own ability to find PACE. Now, here's a question uh, from Michelle. In the case that payment doesn't come until after construction, how are the initial construction costs covered? And have you seen any partnerships with, say, you know, regional or, or local banks uh, to a program's participants for bridge loans, for example. Yeah, I think they, there are some of those going on. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because it's not that kind of information. It's why you know we talk to the program administrators and the pace investors, um, and I'm trying to think of where in terms of where the in Sonoma County certainly since 2008, I think or nine since they've been doing it, local banks have definitely participated in that. Um, but generally, I would say in, in, the, the, the trend is that local banks, uh, unless they have a special deal with that particular program, are not that eager to do it. Or they're not providing 100%. So some of the money, I mean, the thing is, you are going to be paid out in three, or three to six months, say you're doing a retrofit, unless you're doing a huge retrofit like the, I'll show the picture of the Hilton, um, which is the largest pace deal to date. Uh, at least it's been publicly um, discussed. Uh, here we go. Um, this is a big deal, and, and they're basically replacing all their aging equipment in CapEx. And as a result, this is going to take maybe six to nine months to do. Uh, in that case, you know, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, there was no bank involved. There's an investor involved who is, um, is doing it. So whether they're allowing, they are allowing for construction financing, but somehow the bond is being put on in the beginning. It's all rather nebulous, and this is the kind of thing that, again, you don't find out about until you're actually in there trying to buy the deal. Then you find out, oh, actually, if you want to finance this particular project, you need to put up the construction uh, money now, and you'll get the bond after nine months. And a lot of people are like, forget it, I'm not interested. So, you know, it's something that's, it's, I hate to keep using the word evolving, but it is evolving. And it's There's been a lot of press lately, for example, that microgrids, are really starting to take hold in a lot of different regions. Um, and this maybe actually goes back to one of Michelle's original questions about resiliency. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of places are looking at uh, microgrids 
as a way that they could be semi-independent from the larger grids as a way to avoid massive blackouts, whether it's due to storms or, or other technical glitches and that sort of thing. Uh, and given the amount of infrastructure investment that's going to be need to that's going to be made in this country, in the United States, you know, over the next 30 years, what role do you see pace financing and the different energy efficiency financing uh, models playing, you know, vis-a-vis -vis those different infrastructure build-out needs? Uh, is there a role for that there, and how do those th two things fit together? Well, so I'm going to tell a very timely story about something that we're dealing with right now with one of our clients. They um, purchased fuel cells um, to generate electricity, um, and uh, the fuel cell company has now gone bankrupt. And the main reason why they were purchasing them was to have a backup power for their facility, which is senior housing. Uh, so they senior housing, but also there's a like you know kind of care and assisted living, and so they really wanted to have that ability to provide 24/7 uh, electrical capacity. So the fuel cell seemed like a great idea because there's all these tax credits at the federal level, state credits, uh, and the state uh, they're located in um, the ability to um, allocate you know have re renewable energy credits where they can actually generate electricity and get paid for that. So um, Certainly, but the primary reason why they're doing it is for resiliency, is for the fear of the fact that this grid was not reliable. In the case of all these storms in the Northeast, it has not been reliable. So another thing we're looking at right now is to look at how um, combined heat and power, uh, microturbines, microgrids could be an alternative to that. Now this facility is not really necessarily big enough for a large uh, installation, um, but there's absolutely no reason why it can't be tied into energy efficiency financing. And, it will, and it's something that's actually included under the PACE program in Connecticut. So you can actually do microturbines as part of one of the PACE measures, and in most PACE programs. So absolutely, I see that as being uh, one of the major drivers to having this kind of financing take off. Because right. as much as you think energy efficiency is great, if you, don't, if you don't have to do it today, there's not another reason you're not necessarily going to do it today. Because it seems to it seems to me that com combining the technological advances, um, you know, with something like fuel cells. I mean, assuming the company stays in business, of course. Uh, but there's a lot of advances being made in storage now, uh, which is going to going to basically solve the uh, the intermittent um, challenge that you have with the uh, renewables. Yeah, energy storage. We're looking into that as well. It's still relatively expensive for the small scale application that we're looking for. But absolutely, you know, that you can combine that with solar, and it's, you know, there's also some some technologies out there that have like a little wind turbine with solar. You know, that are being actually, I think they took them around after Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey, and they actually use them as standalone generators. All right, let's go ahead and do one final question from Michelle, and um, she asked, how do these projects account for increases in taxes based on assessed value in these calculations? They are looking at this as a year one assessment, just like kind of the not over a certain period of time. So taxes, that is something that folks have discussed, but taxes in terms of the tax basis of the case assessment uh, the, the energy efficiency increases don't necessarily increase the value from an assessment standpoint. It depends on how the count, each county does it, but if you're replacing CapEx, for example, you know, the value in terms of energy savings goes up and your net operating income goes up, but it may be assessed based on you know, a d different methodology on you know, the improvement itself, not so much on the market, you know, independently you know, what's being sold, what cap rates are out in the market. So I, I think it depends more on the county. I feel like assessments always lag behind the market valuation. So when you look at it, particularly in states like California, where assessment is almost a joke, you know, it doesn't even have any relative, you know, um, relationship to what it's really worth. And PACE has not caused this to be, has not made it, or, you know, the, in, the in upgrade has not caused that value to go up necessarily in the assessment. So I don't think there's a direct correlation. I'm sure there's some, some impact, but I don't think it's, uh, it's that large.